part five of cheerful confessionalism. I hope you're feeling very cheerful. We are going to do a couple more weeks, part five and part six, of this sort of precursor to studying our confession, just thinking about confessionalism more generally. And today we're at studying the Bible with the help of our confession. So here's a question for everyone. What are some of the common tools that you use when studying the Bible? Now look, if you go, I don't use any tools, I just read the word. Okay, fine, good for you. But seriously, any tools that you might employ when you are studying the Bible? An accordance. Yeah, an accordance. Do you mean a concordance? Concordance. Ha! I got Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, a concordance, <laughs> yes. He, he, it, was, it was a slip of the tongue. Um, accordance is a popular Bible software, which I use, so yes. I o- that's what you meant, right? So I also use an accordance, and I have a concordance inside my accordance, yes. Any, anything else? Uh, commentaries. Good, commentaries. What are, you, what are your favorite, what's your favorite one? I put a John Cool, I ain't hating. It, so I yeah. All right, your mom stole it, yes? Ooh, that's really good. That's really good, yes. Stevi? A study Bible. So that's almost like, you know, trying to get the best of both worlds where you've got commentaries and you go, this is a lot. I'll make it 10 times shorter and I'll put it in the bottom of my Bible, right? That's what a study Bible is, yeah. Sorry? Blue letter, okay, so it's an online Bible study tool. And it has things like concordances and uh, study Bibles and stuff like that, yes? Ooh, you read it in a different language. So that's not necessarily a tool, but that's a skill that you've developed in your Bible study in being able to read it in its original languages. Oh, like Spanish. You could do that too. Yes. That is very good. Have you ever considered studying the Bible with the help of your statement of faith? With the help of your confession of faith? I hope if you haven't considered it, you will consider it today. Because last week, we thought about what it really means to be a confessional church. It's easy to use that term. We're confessional. And in one sense, every church is a confessional church, right? Every church has a system of doctrine which they believe they've derived from the scriptures. The only question, well, there's a couple of questions, is, is it actually written down or is it up in the air? And even if it is written down or up in the air or in the minds of the pastors, is it a good one or is it a bad one? Is it a sound, robust, biblical confession of faith or is it a not-so-sound one? Is it sloppy? Maybe it's too vague could be any of those things. So we said a confessional church, firstly, is a church that holds, we qualify what kind of confession? A biblically grounded, historically rooted, robust statement of Christian doctrine. Remember we said we're into not doctrinal minimalism, we're into doctrinal, yes, maximalism. Meaning that we believe it is best and healthiest for the church to hold to a statement of faith that somewhat reflects the, we- the width and the depth of the truth of the Word of God itself. And I-, I mentioned this before, you just look at the book of Romans, and he's just trying to unpack the gospel. And he begins with the law and how you're condemned by the law, then he gets to the gospel, then he gets to Israel, then he gets to what's in the end, then he gets to the Christian life, then he gets to this and that, Christian liberty, right? Our own statement of faith should, should reflect the biblical nature of the width and the breadth and the depth of God's truth. Secondly, it's a church that denies biblicism and interprets the scriptures theologically and historically. By biblicism, there's two ways of using it. There's the good kind, which is, hey, I am trying to stick to the word of God. It's my final authority. That's good. But there's the bad kind of biblicism that says, okay, in seeking to be biblical, I want to use only the very words of Scripture, okay? So, in the extreme sense, you know, is the Trinity really in the Bible? I've never seen that word in the Bible, okay? 
Um, does, does the Bible really say that you need to do a membership interview? Whereas somebody who interprets the scriptures more deeply, more thoughtfully, more theologically will say, not in those words, but the Bible does say that the church is supposed to be comprised of believers. Look at the book of Acts. It's those who receive the word of God, believe in the gospel, who are then therefore baptized and so on. And how do you actually find that out unless you hear it from them? Unless you hear their profession of faith. That's why we got stuff like testimonies, one of which we will hear this afternoon. So, we deny biblicism and we interpret the scriptures theologically, we let, as this lady says, in scripture interpret scripture. We're sensitive to the entire theological framework of scripture. We let it speak. We, we think that in, in any given text, there could be multiple layers that we have to unpack, uh, unpack. And really, we're trying to interpret the scriptures the way that Jesus and the apostles interpreted the scriptures. We see types and shadows in the Old Testament. We see promise, fulfillment. We see all that stuff. And theologically might also mean systematic theology. Now, systematic theology is that, that way of studying theology which takes the doctrines of scripture and places them under, the, uh, sorry, under topics or headings. So there's nowhere in the Bible where you start going, okay, what is the doctrine of God? What is the doctrine of um, the Trinity? What is the doctrine of the church? No, what's that? That's us taking what the entire Bible says about the Trinity, about the church, and so on, and systematizing it. Do you get what I'm saying? You are systematizing what the Bible says about any given topic. So I reckon when you usually hear the word theology, very often you're probably thinking of systematic theology. What does the Bible teach about sin? What does the Bible teach about man? What does the Bible teach about salvation? All right, and you, that's where you get all those terms. Soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. All right, stuff like that. Eschatology, the doctrine of the last things. Ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. And we're not only studying the Bible theologically, because it is a theological book, also historically. So I've already heard here somebody say they read a modern commentator. Before we mention some, give me some good dead commentators again, some good commentaries from dead guys. John Gill, John Owen, his Hebrews commentary is the best, John Owen. Matthew Henry, very rich in theology and devotional material. That's what a lot of people read it for because it's so good at that. Anyone else? John yeah, John Flavel. Thomas Aquinas. You, what, what commentary did John Flavel write? I mean, not commentary, but expositions. Okay, all right. <laughs> expositions. Reading sermons that have been recorded for us. That's good too. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, yeah. He threw a good one in there, right? Um, a controversial one. So, <laughs> so... When we read the Bible historically, we're, we're willing to read the Bible in community. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And I'd like to apply that not only to the saints recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Bible, but we can apply that in a sense for us today as well. We have 2,000 years of church history of deep theological meditation upon the scriptures, and we would do well. You would do well if you're studying Hebrews to check out John Owen. You would do well if you're listening to um, a series at church on the Gospel of John and at your home when you study it further, you might actually want to open up Aquinas' commentary on the Gospel of John. It's pretty rich, stuff like that. So we're not reading the Bible in a vacuum. We're sensitive to the fact that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to God's people, illuminating the Scriptures to them for the past 2,000 years, and although those people themselves were not inerrant, inspired, infallible in what they wrote, they do reflect genuine meditation upon the scriptures. And just like you might, I hope, at times, listen to what your pastor has to say <laughs> when he's explaining a passage, well, I tell you, there have been some real pastors way sharper than me way better than me in many things and some of their works are still alive and you can consult them and you can learn from them thirdly a confessional church is a church that expects its teachers to honestly embrace and teach 
its statement of faith. Next week, we'll get to the concept of confessional subscription. Do I actually need to believe what my church believes? Well, you see how that question in itself is kind of weird? Do I actually need to believe what my church believes? Well, you're, what's the church? Is it just some outside entity that you are separated from? Do I need to believe what it believes? Or is being a part of the church actually being, I don't know, a part of the church? <laughs> like what actually comprises the church is the people, the believers in the church. So the answer is a bit obvious, but there's a lot more nuances. Not every Christian comes to a church already embracing the depths of what the church holds to, and that's fine. But at least we have a barometer to, to judge who can be officers, who can be elders and deacons. It's easy to say, I believe the Bible. It's harder to say, what does it mean? Uh, I shared this with some of our men uh, a couple of days ago. You know that there's this old clip of Oprah where there was the boy preacher? He's like, he's like eight years old, chubby kid in a suit. And he's, got, and he's got a tie and everything, and he's like an old, old school King James Bible preacher, right? And his parents bring him there. He's like eight, nine or something. They bring him in front of Oprah, and then he just goes and opens his Bible and just, oh, he doesn't even open his Bible. He doesn't need to. And he just quotes from Ezekiel some scathing rebuke to the people of God. And he, like his oratory skills, his stage presence, he's on fire. It's wonderful. They were very Pentecostal, but it was wonderful, right? And then Oprah, lit, I mean, as, you know, this is going to sound crazy. And then Oprah hits us with some, with some sound thinking and some sound theology. After the kid simply, in a fiery way, quotes the very words of Scripture, Oprah gets up and she says, now, now, excuse me, tell us what it means. And the boy said, it, it, it means what it means. That's what the boy said. He couldn't explain what the Bible is actually teaching. He couldn't apply what the Bible was teaching to the people. So it's not enough for us to choose men that are good at quoting Bible verses. We want to make sure that they have sound doctrine, that they hold to the mystery of the faith with a good conscience. And assuming our confession of faith is sound doctrine, it's a good way of gauging. Are these men actually sound? And fourthly, a confessional church is a church that endeavors to teach its members the whole counsel of God. From the doctrine of Scripture to the doctrine of God and so on, to the doctrine of the covenant, doctrine of salvation, to the doctrine of the law, to Christian liberty, to the doctrine of the church, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, the end times, even government and all of that, it's all in there because we're wanting to teach the members the whole counsel of God. So we ended last week by saying, let your confession help you interpret the Word of God like you would a trusted Bible teacher. It's almost as if you've got something that's whispering in your ear, something that's very sound, that is time-tested, that is attested by, by thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds and thousands and potentially millions of Christians that have affirmed the same things, helping you as you study the Bible. So when you go, Oh, this passage touches on sanctification. I know that word. I learned it in maybe in Sunday school. I want to go deeper into that. What does the rest of the Bible say? If I read the Bible looking for the word sanctification from Genesis to Revelation, it's going to take a really long time. Oh, maybe I have accordance and I can look up the word sanctification in a concordance, which is, which is basically, it's like a dictionary, all right? Looking at the words, its usage, how many times it's used and so on. I can look it up and find out more and to go in depth on this topic, I can look at my statement of faith, our church's confession of faith, which has thought very deeply about what sanctification means, like a trusted Bible teacher. You do this often. You study the Bible. You have a question. You want to know more. You ask somebody whom you know knows a lot about Scripture. That's what we're doing. So again, I mentioned, you know, from the Holy Scriptures down to chapter 16 on good works. Chapter 17 is on the perseverance of the saints all the way to chapter 30 on the uh, 32, 31 and 32 on death and then the last judgment. So take these as... 
many, many people for many, many years looking at the same Bible you're looking at and being able to mine out the truth of God on all of these important topics and now you have it at your disposal and you can make use of it and you can learn from it. So, um, I, 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 I got this from, uh, you, know, you know, Peanuts? Peanuts comic, right? What's the name of the boy? I think it's Linus. Uh, and the girl is named, does anybody know her name? I know the boy's Linus. I actually got this screenshot from one of, our, one of the lecturers I used to have at RTC named uh, Martin Williams, and it's, it's about theology. It's probably not real. I don't even remember. Um, but the lady says, boy, look at that. Look at it, rain. What if it floods the whole world? Oh, innocent little child. She's worried that the whole world is going to end because of the icebergs melting. And then Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And she says, oh, you've taken a great load off of my mind. And Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. It's just a great little example of what having sound theology in your back pocket can do for everyday life. So everyone interprets the Bible theologically, we must admit. Everyone interprets the Bible with some historical theology, right? So you're a Protestant, which in your mind means, I'm not a Roman Catholic. And you might have a simple understanding of that. Roman Catholics believes in some kinds of works contributing to salvation. I'm not that, so I believe it's by grace alone through faith alone. Even if that's all you're understanding and you start engaging with the Bible, that's historical theology. You're, you're, you're doing historical theology even without thinking about it. You're reading the Bible as a 2023 Protestant Christian who is not Roman Catholic, right? And you're doing that consciously, not so consciously, but you're doing it. So let's just admit that we're doing it and let's endeavor that we cannot avoid doing it and let's try to do it well, okay? Something really technical, very quick. Um, we talked about this in our hermeneutics class. I had Ilya talk about some of this in that class when I had COVID. Um, we <clears throat> begin engaging the Bible, at least we try to, through simply reading the Bible and doing exegesis. That is, drawing out the meaning of the text. In doing so, we would do well to then make use of biblical theology, whole Bible, Christ-centered theology, because that's what the Bible's about. You're reading a book in the Bible, and you're looking down at what the text says, but you're also looking left and looking right. Where are we in redemptive history? Are we in the Old Covenant? Are we in the New Covenant? How does this text point us to Christ? How does it contribute to God's overarching plan of redemption. And you think about the themes. Oh, I see a king in this passage. I know how God develops the theme of king in this passage. I need to think about that. And then there's this mediating principle called historical theology. And as you're thinking about the king theme, you go, you know what? There were all of these awesome Christians that were really smart a few hundred years ago, and they kept talking about how Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. I think there's something to that. I think that's in our confession. I think that's something that we should talk about. And you start going deeper into the scriptures, thinking about that, and then you get to, well, systematic theology. And as you're reading it, you're seeking to develop your understanding of the offices of Christ. What does it mean that he is priest? What does it mean that he is prophet? What does it mean that he is king? And as you're doing all of this study, you're understanding your passage even better. So you begin with the Bible, you inevitably read it in light of the whole Bible, and in light of that, you interpret the text even better. And then you keep reading it in light of the whole Bible, and as you're reading it in light of the whole Bible, you start thinking about what the community of saints are saying, has been saying about this text. You go back to your text, you interpret it even better. And then you're thinking about it, and your doctrine is becoming sharper, and you know, when you began reading the text, maybe you were crazy, you were thinking Jesus is not king for some reason. But now you've come to the point, I've thought about it a lot, and I've read the Bible, and I've been thinking about it, Jesus is definitely king. And you go back to the text and you go, this text is talking about Jesus. 
because he is the ultimate king. You see how it keeps feeding to it? So these are not completely independent of each other. As you use these discipline, engage in these disciplines, you keep going to the scriptures and hopefully each step of the way you get better. You get better at the, the way that you interpret the Bible. So now we go into a scene, all right? Actors and actresses, pretend you're studying the Bible, all right? But actually do it, actually get your Bibles, all right? Here's the scene. I know it's a bit hard, but pretend that we're at a Wednesday night Bible study, which we may be in one in the future, right? We're at a Wednesday night <laughs> Bible study. Let's try, to, let's try to pretend. So here we are. Hi, everybody. So maybe we're sitting around the table. It's wonderful. Everyone's got their Bibles. It's a Wednesday night. It's midweek. It's been awesome. It's been great. You had a busy day at work. We're opening the Bible, and there's a Bible study leader, and the series of this Bible study is the book of Hebrews. You've gone through chapter 1, gone through chapter 2, gone through chapter 3. You've learned about how Jesus is better than Moses, better than the angels, better than Joshua, better, better, better. He's better. He's better than everything. He's better than the entire Levitical priesthood. It's so good. And then you get to, I might have skipped, but anyway, you get to chapter 4. Okay? I mean 6, my bad. And you get to this part of the Bible study. Okay? And just like in any Bible study, um, you ask. Um, I'd like, a, I'd like a, a slightly British accent. So, Dosh, could you please read Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Okay, it's Bible study time. Engage. We think about it. What is this passage saying? It seems to be saying that there are some people, okay, and the author of Hebrews is acknowledging that some of the people that are going to be receiving this letter that he's writing might be in this position, and it's scary. There are some people who have been, in some sense, enlightened, tasted the whole heavenly gift, look at this one, shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, but then they fall away. And he's saying that for these people who finally fall away, even after receiving all of that, it is impossible to restore them again to repentance. It's as if they're crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. The Bible study leader says something like, in that last portion, you know, picture it this way. When you've received so much truth and you still spurn that truth, you spit in the face of Christ, you turn your back on Him and you continue and you show your true colors and you rebel against Him and you now hate Him and reject Him even to the day of your death. It's as if, you know, you're almost like, Zooming back to the days of the crucifixion where the people or the trial of Christ or the people are screaming crucify him Crucify him and it's as if you were one of the people in the crowd You're joining yourselves back with the sinners with them who are saying crucify him crucifying him You're holding Christ up for contempt. So it's a scary serious passage and then Somebody asks a question and raises their hand and this somebody he's not he's not a member of our church You see and this person was just brought just brought, it was just some friend from uni brought by Tenatsua. Brought him over this Wednesday night Bible study, right? And he goes, yeah, you know, I've really been studying this and this is, this is such a difficult passage. And I think, I think it's really, really clear here that, you know, some people, they become a Christian, you know, they, they, they believe in Jesus, they get saved. But then one day, if you're not careful, you'll fall away. You're not careful, you'll lose your way. And that's why we need to try hard to persevere. You know, and you find out later on that he's some kind of Armenian, who knows. Anyway, and he's just sharing this in the Bible study, right? Um, and the, the Bible study leader is trying to, to bring us back to something that we believe is more sound in accordance to our uh, confession. But he's wrestling with it. And it's causing some of the other members not to, not to you know, go crazy, but yeah, you know what? It is a difficult passage. 
We do need to think a little bit more like it. And the Bible study leader, he's being cordial. You know, he's being respectful in everything. Um, and, you know, Ilya raises his hand. He's had enough of that being cordial stuff. And he, he raises his hand, right? And he goes, uh, uh, well, 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 uh, as Pastor Josh just, you know, talked about many months ago in the Baptist Catechism, we read from question number 39. Uh, could I just quote it for you? And he quotes, quotes it. And, you know, it says, what are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? Uh, and all the people f somehow memorized it and recited it out loud, the answer. The benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, increase of grace, and perseverance to the end. And we make it clear, we're, this is not the inspired words of God. This is from our, our catechism. But do we believe this? And if we do believe this, especially the last sentence, that if you are justified by faith, if you are declared righteous by God, you've been made a child of God, one of the gifts that you're now given and are irrevocable is increase of grace and perseverance all the way to the end. So that friend that Tanaswa brought is like, okay, that sounds good. I know I've heard people teach this, but just look at Hebrews. Just look at Hebrews chapter 6. It really seems like somebody can become a believer and then they fall away, all right? And then, and then some of the others, right? Some of the, some, of the, some of the older, more mature gentlemen, they step in and they've got some really good Bible verses, right? No one can, you know, Lincoln steps in and goes, you know, I love this discussion, but... No one can snatch you from the Father's hand. You know, that's so clear. That's so clear. No one can snatch you from the Father's hand. And people give some more proof texts. You know, the, the, the work that He began in you, He will finish it, right? You, you start quoting these things and it's great, but how do we wrestle with this? Are we now dealing with two contradictory teachings in the Bible? Um, and you go, well, perseverance, we can go deeper into that. In fact, our own confession of faith says that those God has accepted... In the beloved, beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, and given the precious faith of his elect, can neither totally nor finally fall from a state of grace. They will certainly persevere in grace to the end and be eternally saved because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. And you start going, okay, how do we interact with this? I know this is our belief. I know we've believed this and I know we've held to this and I assume we've held to this because it's drawn out carefully from the scriptures. How can this now help me as I go back to doing the hard work of studying Hebrews chapter 6? Let's read it again. It is impossible in the case of those. So there's a group, those who have once been enlightened, tasted heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. But the sharp Bible study leader goes, all that we've just discussed is super helpful. And I'll tell you what's even better. If we actually look at the immediate context of the text, we can glean a lot. The next verse says, For... Okay, so it is a Wednesday night Bible study, so we ask funny questions like, what is the for there for? What do you think the for means? Hmm? What, what does that mean? It's, it, it's connected to what was previously said. It gave a statement, a proposition, and then it says for, because, or it, in order to illustrate what I have just said, let me tell you this. Land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But, it bear, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Same rain, two different kinds of soil, you might say, two different kinds of land, one that is receptive to the rain and produces fruit, one that is not receptive and instead it bears thorns and thistles. I think Jesus Christ said something about uh, similar to this. Does anybody know? Uh, somebody else in the Bible study goes, oh, this sounds a lot like the parable of the sower. 
the parable of the four souls. Not exactly like that. This is a little bit more succinct. Now we've just talked about two kinds. And really, in the parable of the sower, there really, in one sense, is two kinds. Those that end up being the good soil and the others just aren't. They're, they appear in different forms, but they just aren't. Right? Okay, so how does this illustration explain the teaching that was just said in verses 4 to 6? So are we talking about every, the same um, people who become actual Christians and truly receive the Word of God implanted in their hearts, believe it, and have new life, and some of those people end up becoming not Christians or falling away? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about one group of people or are we talking about two distinct groups of people? Two dis distinct groups of people. Two different kinds of land. Both received rain. Both received rain. But if I may put it this way, one received rain in a superficial sense. It only maybe covered the surface. It received it, but it only covered the surface of the soil. And it never went and actually produced um, uh, um, you know, nutrition and all of that. The other kind of land truly received the soil. Not just skin deep, but all the way to the depths of the heart. So that it was proven to be the good soil in the way that it produced fruits. We're actually talking about true Christians versus on, those who only look like Christians, appear to be Christians, but actually haven't truly received the rain, haven't received new life. And then somebody is using one of those neat little study Bibles. And as the Bible study leader is teaching this, and he's doing a pretty good job, you know, somebody opens up their Reformation Heritage Study Bible. Maybe, does anybody have one of these? I love this one. No? It's just... Okay, not the, no heritage? No heritage? Come on, you gotta have the heritage. Um, anyway, somebody has it. <laughs> somebody has it, and they open it up, and they go, that sounds a lot like what I'm reading in my study Bible, and it makes a lot of sense with the rest of the Bible. And then with this tool, they start bringing in Old Testament insight, which is good. So when it says that these people were once enlightened, the study Bible says the Greek word here recalls the Spirit's guidance of the people in the Exodus through the pillar of fire. They were also enlightened. Did it necessarily mean all of them were born again? No. Tasted of the heavenly gift. It says, the manna God provided in the wilderness was known as the heavenly food. Just because you received the manna in the wilderness, did it truly mean that you have received the bread of life? Christ himself? Not necessarily. And finally, partakers of the Holy Ghost. Well, you think, okay, this one's hard. Because I only know about the Holy Spirit working truly in the hearts of genuine believers. But look at this example, Balaam and Saul in the Old Testament in Numbers 24 and 1 Samuel 10, 1 Samuel 10. They show that people can in one sense partake of the Holy Spirit in an outward way without having His saving grace. The Holy Spirit can enact upon a person, can come upon a person in various ways without necessarily changing their hearts. So you see that the Holy Spirit in Numbers 24 came upon Balaam, 1 Samuel 10 came upon Samuel. Did it mean that the Holy Spirit regenerated and indwelt them? Not necessarily. In the same sense, a church attender can experience many things that look, feel, and sound Christian. Have you ever met a, a person who went to church with you, they heard the sermon, and when you talked to them, the way that they expressed their emotions, you could tell they genuinely were feeling something inside, like they really were in one sense convicted. But that still begs the question, is it a repentance unto sorrow and death, or is it a repentance unto life and hope in Jesus Christ? There is still that distinction. And so, we learn more about this idea of the Spirit making people born again. Those who are not elected will not and cannot truly come to Christ and therefore cannot be saved because they are not effectually drawn by the Father. Look at this. They may even be called by the ministry of the Word so they can receive, in a sense, the ministry of the Word. Like they can have fun at Bible study and enjoy the Bible study. They can go to church and go, that was a great sermon. I'm going to apply it in my life. It can happen. 
and they can even receive some, this is what it's called, ordinary or common workings of the Spirit without being saved. There is an external effect upon a person who lives his life with Christians in the church, seems to look, act, and feel like he is one of us. You know, it can change his values, his outlook on life. It can change his decisions in life. But it's still possible that that person may be the land that only received the rain superficially. We believe in the necessity of the new birth. And so with all of that, we just got into it. I mean, we, 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 we thought about biblical theology by looking at the confessions and stuff. We looked at historical theology. This is what people have said for a long time. We, we, by looking at the Old Testament back and forth, we, you know, biblical theology again, just all of this again and again, systematic theology. What is effectual calling? What does it mean to be born again? You thought about all those things. And as you continue doing that, you once again re-engage with Hebrews 6 and you go, this makes complete sense. This really does. And I'm looking at it now. I don't think I'm superimposing anything to this text. The text itself is now clearer to me. I'm not putting anything into the text. I have just used these tools to help me better draw out what's already in the text. And now I read those first couple of verses and I know that this person that is being spoken of in verses four to six is like the kind of land in verses seven to eight that has received rain, I'm sorry, that has, um, yeah, the, the latter part, received rain, but has produced thorns and thistles. He is not the good soil. He is not the one with a new heart. This is not someone who converts into true Christianity and then deconverts out of it. This is not someone who was born again, then died again. That's just impossible. So many reasons why the Bible would disagree with you. This is a person who has received the ministries uh, of the Holy Spirit, of the Word, and all of these things superficially. But in the end, turned from Christ, revealed His true colors. He was like an illegal alien who made his way into the local church, but such time came that he was revealed and his false, falsified papers and documentation and visa application and all of that was revealed to be false. They were counterfeit. And so he showed his true colors and was removed. And this makes even more sense because in the verses that come after verses 7, 8, and 9, I think this might be verse 10, I forget, I, I made a typo. The author of Hebrews speaks to the people in that day, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So for the true Christians... For the true believers who have received the ministry of word and spirit and who have begun to experience new life and the fruits thereof, this is salvation. You see the distinction? The person described who falls away, for his case, it is not salvation. But for your case, the ones who truly belong to Christ, the ones who have really received the spirit, we speak to you of better things, things that belong to salvation. So this is not getting salvation and losing salvation. This is one truly has always had salvation. One only appeared to have salvation, but revealed that they never had it in the first place. This is what we just did. I know it's a technical diagram, but that is what we just did. And I, I remember like a while back, this was very, very much neat in my mind as I was enjoying um, what it means to be a confessional Christian, but I just remember um, taking a theology class and actually using Hebrews chapter 6, one, one of our lectures, and it was the same guy, Martin Williams, just decided to very helpfully show that, no, this is how we can actually do this. You can open up your Bible, right, and you can have your confession at the back, like I do in this Creeds and Confessions Bible, right, and you can actually go back and forth and assuming that your confession is sharp, it is sound, it is well thought out, it is historically time tested, it will help you better engage the scriptures. Again, let your confession help you interpret the word of God like you would a trusted Bible teacher. Just like that. Questions? Everywhere. <laughs> it fits in everywhere, doesn't it? Right? Um, 
So, oh, that's your question. Okay. Covenant theology is something that requires both biblical and systematic theology. So when you speak of biblical theology, systematic theology, often we're talking about disciplines of theology that we must engage in. Covenant theology is similar, but it, it is, okay, we view God's covenant as the undergirding framework for understanding all of redemptive history. So it's all of that. It is a hermeneutic. It is a way of doing biblical theology. It informs your systematic theology. And I might add, it is very, very well attested in history and historical theology, right? Um, so I would say, yeah, I, you know, in the future as we develop these things in seminaries, I wouldn't be surprised if they would be more clear in diagrams like that of the place that your covenant theology plays in all of these disciplines. But it, it, it colors almost everything, right? Because it, especially in biblical theology, when you're looking at God's outworking of His plan of redemption, that in itself, that statement is a covenant theology statement. You're saying that He has a plan of redemption that is working out all throughout history. And if you know your covenant theology, you know that's rooted in the eternal pact between Father, Son, and Spirit who decreed an elect, who decreed to redeem them, who decreed to send the Spirit for them, and then everything happening in creation is an outworking of that plan. So you, you can't help it. Yeah. Would you say that a confession is essentially... Hello. Yeah. Would you say that a confession is essentially systematic theology but very brief? The, co the confession of faith is, if we had to put, them, put it under one of those disciplines, it is a work of systematic theology, um, most directly, because it is taking the doctrines of Scripture, the topics of Scripture, the headings that we have there, and taking what the entire Bible has. One of the things, by the way, we didn't do in our reenactment, in our um, case study of pretending to be in a midweek Wednesday night Bible study, is to then begin to look at the proof texts of the confession because that's super helpful as well and sometimes you'll find out the text that you're studying is one of the proof texts and that's why it yeah anyway primarily it is a work of systematic theology but it is also um, inevitably um, a work of historical theology because it's rooted in the earlier confessions and even in the early creeds and then we're a few hundred years far removed so we're also when we're reading the confession we're doing historical theology Right? And the confession itself, I truly believe, is an excellent work of exegetical theology because it was produced through sound, patient exegesis of the Word of God. That's what the Westminster divines, who made the Westminster Confession of Faith, were doing for two years. They were doing that for two entire years wrestling with the scriptures in the original languages and thinking about what the church fathers and the medieval church had to say about these things. And that's why we Baptists just baptized it because we thought that was good work. It's good exegesis. So again, it touches all of these things, but yes, primarily, if you look at the way that it's laid out, it is a systematic theology um, summary, if you will. A summary of the whole counsel of God, heading per heading. Yes? Mm. So, like you were saying, um, you, you can use a confession like you would a trusted Bible study teacher. But I feel like people are often more willing to trust this teacher versus one. Yeah. Confession. Yeah. Behind that? Oh, they didn't attend this class, is <laughs> 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 really what's, what's behind that. Um, yeah, there is something of, I mean, let's be, we're human beings. We are people, we're made body and soul, we're relational creatures. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how, you know, we, we, we claim not to be into celebrityism as Christians, but it's hard not to have it. When you have even not your own pastor, but a trusted Bible teacher that you've been listening to for a long time, and he was the one that taught you all of this sound doctrine and everything, and then you go to a Bible study, and this new mate of yours just bashes that guy, you're like, yo, don't speak ill 
of my favorite Bible teacher. Right? What do you mean he's wrong on this and that, right? So there is this very personal relational aspect which makes complete sense because we are not only to be taught propositional truth, proposi these truths are best taught in a shepherding, discipling context. And I would argue, of course, that's even better if they're your actual pastor and not just a guy online. So one of the reasons for the disconnect is that more than ever, we have a lot more famous, influential Bible teachers that do not find themselves strongly tethered into a historic confessional framework. And usually then, that, using the guise of we're being biblical, unfortunately, that style of um, public ministry and Bible teaching ministry has sometimes been pitted against the more traditional confessional statement of faith guys that quote the catechisms. And the two are being pitted against each other. And, and that's a very unfortunate thing. And I think that, let's be honest, has left a bad taste in some people's mouths. You know, they think of a guy that doesn't, you know, you don't have to quote these statements and this guy, you just got to teach me the plain Bible. And a lot of times they are really good and they are really sound. And you get that, you imbibe that, that's really great. And you see that as almost like a philosophy of ministry. But the truth is what people don't realize is written or unwritten, that guy is coming from a confession. So then I would challenge anybody to go, okay, do you actually want to? Do you actually want to trust a single, still alive man who is still going through life and learning things in ministry versus thousands upon thousands of theologians that have thought deeply about these things and have succinctly delivered these things to us, truly believing that this is the faith of the New Testament apostles passed down to us. I'm not saying one is necessarily perfect and the other isn't. I'm just saying that you might not realize it, but you are trusting a personality a little bit more than you'd like to think. And I think it is sound for us, for, like, like I, I'm, not meeting, I'm not meeting the people who were alive during the Bible times. It's great that I have it written for us, right? And I'm not saying the confession is the Bible, but it's great that we actually can have it written and then over hundreds of years it's open for public scrutiny you know it's open for correction how many times have we had a brilliant bible teacher we believed everything that they've said but let's be honest eventually time comes and we come to different convictions and we should be willing to admit that that is it comes with the territory of being a human being that's still alive today, that's still teaching. The benefit of the dead guys is that they're already dead. They can't even defend themselves anymore. If you're gonna thrash them, you're gonna thrash them, right? And you can pick apart their ideas and you can so clearly, after the fact, in retrospect, properly scrutinize and criticize them. And if what they're teaching actually stands the test of time, that is a greater testimony than your favorite Bible teacher alive today. Give that man a mic. <laughs> to use an analogy, when Please we think do. of like the classics of music, for example, the, the music that has stand, stood the test of time, so Beethoven's and Brahms, etc. Um, they've stood the test of time. They've endured not only through their own generation, but generations after and after and after. And they'll be played even today. They'll be played four or five, six hundred years after we've all died. But if you go on to um, you know, Spotify and you just find you know, the latest track of this particular kind of music, how many of those songs are going to be played in 100 years from now? Don't know. Maybe a couple of them, maybe some of them. Yes. But the reality is that music doesn't stand the test of time. So that's just an analogy to say that when we think about um, listening to the voices of the past and why we should listen to them is because they have stood the test of yes. time. Um, whereas, you know, m many of our, many of the people that we look up to even now, yes, much of what they say will stand the test of time because it is in alignment with scripture and it is aligned with, 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 um, with um, truth, but other elements may not be. So we shouldn't give ourselves wholly over to uh, any individual interpreter. Sure. Yes. One artist, one singer. So I will, I will just say, 
to that, right? It's an analogy, and just, just remember that it is a mere analogy. There is inherently, obviously, much more in experience subjectivity to what makes good music because some of the really bad songs that we're playing today, sadly, might, <laughs> might stand the test of time. And I think I, th I could think of maybe a couple of really bad songs that have stood the test of time that are still hanging around. But it, it, is, it, it can be a useful analogy nonetheless. Obviously, there's a bit more clarity when it comes to the Word of God as to, well, is it drawn from Scripture or is it not drawn from Scripture? There's a little bit more of a science into that um, process. But yes, you, you see that similar phenom phenomenon. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah um Verse six. Um, it talks. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about the idea of the rain, like falling like skin deep on the soil and sure. stuff like that. Um, I thought it was my drink. Hold on, never mind. Um, uh, and yeah, in verse six. Uh, so and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Yes. And kind of that idea. The again kind of makes it sound like they were like in a state of repentance. Mm. Maybe you covered that, I wasn't listening. Maybe yeah, well, the, again, yeah. Um, repentance, right? Again, you have to consider what, what do we mean mm. by that, sure. right? Um, will they ever have remorse again once they are confirmed in their final apostasy? And I do believe that this passage is talking about final apostasy. I believe it has some relationship to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is outright and final rejection of Christ himself. There is no repentance for such people, especially repentance, which is, I mean, apostasy, which is final. So I think the again there, there's a few ways that you can approach it, right? What, what do you mean? Is it mean that they had true repentance beforehand and it's impossible that they would have true repentance again? What does your systematic theology say? What does your historical theology say? What does the rest of the Bible say? And you start meditating on it. Then you go, okay, so the emphasis here is not this black and white, they once truly repented and now they can't do it again. The point is they once expressed repentance. They once looked like the good soil. They once had remorse. And, and, and Corinthians is helpful here because unbelievers do repent, don't they? But their repentance is a repentance unto death and sorrow where our repentance is a repentance unto life. So you let those passages and of course your whole system and everything help you in that area. In a similar sense, perhaps it's like where Esau like sought repentance. Well, that's yeah, exactly where Hebrews goes yeah. later on. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Tanatsua and then one more question. Yep. I have two questions if that's right. <laughs> String them together into one. Oh, uh, okay. When the confessions were being made we obviously had a thousand theologians coming together sure when the world's best of course right yeah but when they were obviously agreeing was it a majority rule or did they all have to come to the same convictions right so if we're talking about the westminster assembly the westminster confession reflects what we believe is a good confession of faith um, uh, it is a consensus document. Now, let me qualify that. By consensus document, I don't just mean... Okay, let's sit down. Let's do a vote. What do you all believe about this topic? Okay, majority wins. Boom. Let's do it. A consensus document speaks of, yes, there is something to be said if everyone is coming to these conclusions as they rigorously study the scriptures and there's only a small group but it also means that we engage with that small group. We allow that small group to speak into it, like in the Westminster Assembly, for example, and this is why this is not a perfect practice all the time. There were Congregationalists present. What is a Congregationalist? They believe in our church government, independent church government, all right? No higher authority than the local church and so on. They were present at the assembly, but they were outgunned. They had good arguments, and they gave some really good contributions to the Westminster Confession of Faith, but church government was definitely not one of them. And, and that's why we felt, they felt the need to amend the confession, and then we felt the need to take theirs and amend it even further. But the importance of still approaching this work as a consensus document is that at the end of the day, what we want to pin down in our confession of faith, all right, is what Christians ought to believe. Somebody's put it this way. The creeds are what Christians believe. Period. 
if you don't believe in the, you're not a Christian. This is what Christians believe. When you get to our more robust confessions, this is not only about who is a Christian, it's about the entirety of Christian life, doctrine, practice, and all of that, and all the ins and outs. This is now what Christians ought to believe. So do Christians really have to believe in order to really have a fruitful Christian life? Postmillennialism versus amillennialism. Now, you know, you should feel strongly about your positions and you should advocate for it and you should lobby for it. But a consensus document means that actually we can disagree on these positions and we can craft chapter 31 and 32 in such a way that even those who disagree on the millennial issue can embrace it while before it even came into being, very wisely they ruled out dispensationalism. Good job on them. So that's the way a consensus document should work. Do you really need to add another question? Yes. The mechanics of that work. Give him the mic. You're done. <laughs> we gotta no, no, we gotta end. We're keeping time. The, um, uh, the uh, way that that worked um, is that three quarters vote was required for. That's not on. The way that it worked was that a three-quarters vote was required and the people who were outvoted would still need to say, I, I would perhaps um, I would perhaps vote uh, word that differently, but I can still assent to it. And the majority would still say, we are not excluding you by this. So yeah, the way that the Westminster divines themselves meant the Westminster Confession, the Congregationalists in and of themselves were not excluded. And the Congregationalists said, we can assent to this, but we would uh, word that uh, uh, differently. Hmm. And so, and so you know, but other than that, a three-quarter vote would need, need to be established yes. in order, uh, before a majority minority. If That's necessary. The That's right. And thank you for that. And that highlights the fact that our confessions are supposed to be statements of unity. Our, our concern when we have a document like this is not who's in, who's out. That's not the main concern. How many people can we kick out so that they can't be happy in our church, you know? It's not that. And I know we, we poke fun at this and that, but you know, my, our desire is not actually to kick people out. Our desire is as faithfully as we can, how can we word this in such a way, how can we present the doctrines of Scripture in such a way that the widest, most vast group of Christians can still go, hey, I wouldn't word it that way, I won't necessarily emphasize that but I can come and embrace that and I can live charitably in a ministry like this that is our desire it's not to kick people out it's actually to bring people in and to unite the church so brothers and sisters I'll, I'll probably end with that that this is a way of being united not superficially here's a confession everybody believe it now we're united that's not unity that's uniformity true unity is found when we slowly but surely through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our ministries, in the church, in our lives, begin to embrace this whole counsel of God. And then the next time we reenact a scenario from a Wednesday night Bible study, and that guy comes up again and says something weird, the church is filled with a bunch of cheerful, confessional folks that take a step back and maybe smile and go, my dear friend, let, let, us, let us patiently take you through why you are very wrong and that the scriptures actually teach otherwise and be able to show it with much wisdom, prudence, patience, and sharpness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this study. We thank you that in our um, reenacting a Bible study, we actually had a Bible study, and we pray that we would always do that. <laughs> and we pray, Lord God, that we would be students, studious in that way. Thank you for these tools. Thank you for these means. Thank you for the people that have gone before us. We are indeed like dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants, and we appreciate them, Lord. And we thank you for your work in their lives and how we are benefiting from what people have been doing and have been saying in the past many hundreds and even a couple of thousand years. Oh, Lord, may you continue to build up this community of saints so that we can be like the Bereans who are not just looking at the Bible alone in their rooms, but we're actually engaging in it together in community with the help of other people where iron sharpens iron. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.